Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, uh, my name is Evan Yu, and I work on an open source JavaScript framework called Vue.js. And today I'm going to be talking about reactivity in front end JavaScript frameworks. Really long title. And uh, I actually instantly regretted this title the, the moment I started working on it, because I realized, what does reactive mean anyway? This term is so confusing today, if you think about it. Um, this is a screenshot that I took from Eric Mayer's talk, uh, who, was, who worked on RxJS at Reactive Extensions at Microsoft. And he gave a talk on what is reactive programming. And this is what he had in the slides about the endless confusion of what does reactive actually mean. Um, is reactive RxJS? Well, I think we can say Rx is reactive for sure, but the opposite might not be that accurate, right? You cannot just say reactive programming is just Rx, right? It, there's a lot of other things that can also be called qualify as reactive. There's really nothing that mandates something reactive must have to do with observables or streams. And then there's also functional reactive programming, FRP, a term which is also very confusing, because you, know, you either stick to the very narrow definition outlined in the original paper by, uh, by uh, Kono Elliott, uh, which means essentially most of the things that claim to be FRP today aren't actually FRP, or you agree that everyone is entitled to their opinion, which makes the term largely pointless. Um, so what am I even talking about? Uh, well, this talk is not really about reactivity, not about finding what reactivity really means. It's about the bits of reactivity concepts that I found useful, I encountered in the process of making a JavaScript frameworks, um, and also reading code of other JavaScript frameworks. So yeah, it's really about how things happen in JavaScript frameworks. Um, so one thing we know that is when state changes in our application, things happen. The framework does some work for us, and the DOM just updates, right? A lot of times, it just seems like magic. Like, how does the framework know things happen? How does it do the work? So I want to take a step back and just start with very, very simple uh, situation. Let's write a very simple program. Let's say we have a variable with a value 3. And your boss gives you an assignment, tell you, hey, the requirement of this program is we have a variable b, which must always be 10 times the value of a. Right? And so you write the program. Uh, you just, you know, b equals a times 10, easy. And you log it. Yes, it's 30. Right? Correct program. And then you assign a to 4, and you log again, and oh, it's out of sync. So you fix it. Uh, but now we have repetition, right? You have to remember to set b equals a times 10 every time you change a. And you know this is a, obviously a potential source of bug. You have to remember it all the time. If you write 10 as uh, you, forget, you, you know, make a typo and things just break. So after a while, you realize what your boss is really is asking you to build is just a spreadsheet, right? He's asking you to build Excel, competitor. Um, cell B1's value is expressively, uh, expressed de declaratively as um, a dependent, uh, it's dependent on the value of the cell A1. Right? So it's, it's determined by a formula. So it automatically updates when we edit A. Now, if you were at .js last year, you probably is thinking now, this is exactly the same example Andre Stoltz used in his talk. All right, up to this point. This is where we diverge, because I'm, I'm not here to sell observables. Um, to, to fulfill the requirements of program, let's just think about the, the simpler way, uh, the maybe naive way to do it. Right? We just want to know when A changes. Right? Uh, so let's imagine we magically implement this function called on A changed. We somehow know that A changes. Then inside that function, we, we give it some, something to execute, and we just you know, set B's value 
2 times a times 10. So uh, assuming that this function works correctly, now our program actually fulfills the requirement. Uh, because whenever a changes, b will always be 10 times a, right? Now, let's think about how we actually just work beyond the values and think about how to work with the actual interface. So we write some HTML, and we want to update it. The imperative version of it is we just query selector and set its text content to state a uh, multiplied by 10. And the equivalent of our magic on a change function, we can just you know imagine we magically implement on state changed, and we do the same thing again. Now this program is declarative, right? Whenever we change a, uh, this cell's text content will be always automatically updated to reflect the correct value. And to abstract that even further, right? We can somehow have a template rendering engine, maybe like. You know, we, we just use a mustache tag to say, hey, we just want this value to be here in the template. And whenever the on state change, we just do this re-render thing. Right? This template doesn't necessarily have to be you know, a template. It can be JSX, a render function, hyperscript, whatever you want. But most importantly, um, we've arrived at this beautiful functional representation of what the app is, which many of you are already familiar with if you've you know, worked with all these React concepts. Um, this assignment to view can be interpreted differently based on how you look at it. Uh, in the virtual DOM context, we can think of the view as a vir new virtual DOM tree that's generated. But for the sake of discussion, we'll you know, skip the part where we patch the virtual DOM into the actual DOM. And let's just assume that this, this line when you re-render the thing, it just like applies everything and updates the DOM. All the side effects uh, are already applied. So, and another point is, to be fair, this is only half the picture, right? Uh, we are only dealing with the state and the view, the relationship between the state and view here. Um, but in UI, there's also the concern of how you map the user inputs to changes in state. Um, so. We'll, we'll leave this part out for this talk because that's not the focus. But you know, just to to be fair, in uh, cycle terms, this is basically um, the intent because cycle is like model view intent, right? So we're leaving the intent part out, and uh, the intent part is actually a domain that you know RX uh, observables are really good at. But um, that's not the focus of this talk. So now the question is, how does the application actually know when to Recall, rerun this function, right? Well, let's let's find out. Let's write some code, right? Um, this is our extremely simple implementation of on state change. We just take the update function and save it somewhere, and then we expose a function called set state. It takes the new state, replaces the state, and calls the saved update function. And voila, we've implemented React. Um, so uh, this would actually work because um, you know everything is so far we've been following along this idea of when state changes we just re-render everything and things should be in sync right and this extremely simple interpretation of React of course of course it's not 100% accurate but um, you get the idea right so if we tweak these samples slightly we can you know Redux is basically changing the line to store subscribe and store dispatch. Right, we are skipping the reducer part, but you, know, you can see the connection here. Angular 1, basically, you just you know, do a scope watch. Watch for any change on the scope. And later on, when you need to change the state, you just set scope A equals 5. And well, if you do it manually, you will have to call scope apply. But Angular does the smart thing for you if you Assign the value in an uh, event handler. It just assumes something has changed and will call apply for you. And in Angular 2, similarly, uh, we have lifecycle tick. And it's a bit smarter than Angular 1 because it has zone JS, which even knows that something initiated from uh, asynchronously from within an Angular uh, event handler, it will just keep following that async zone and you know, call lifecycle tick for you. 
So in real-world applications, though, like the, this view equals rendered state function is extremely naive, right? In real-world applications, the update cycle is rarely that simple. In most cases, the app's update computations form a tree that maps to our component tree. And the aforementioned implementations share a common trait. That is, they all need this explicit signal to start this update process. Right? Set state or the, you know, the uh, Angular is being smart about automatically applying that, but it's still an explicit call to scope apply. Um, so now when the state changes, this naive, uh, our naive implementation would re-render the app, re-render the world. Uh, and we'd love to believe that is fast enough, but in reality, that is not often the case. So we have to look for ways to skip work um, if we want to actually make it fast. And an ob obvious thing we can do is to allow the pull signal to be sent out from any node in this tree. Note that this is based upon the assumption that the data flow is one way between the components, from always from parent to child. Right? Uh, luckily, most major firmwares today follow that rule. So we can safely assume that um, if the pull signal is emitted from a, a node in the tree, only the subtree from that node needs to be checked again. Uh, we can safely ignore the rest. Right? And, but we still may be overcomputing. A parent node changing doesn't necessarily mean all of its children need to change as well. So in a pull system, we don't really know what has changed. Right? Uh, it has to recompute the whole subtree just to be safe. So as a result, the framework has to expose a way for the developer to give a hint to the system to say, hey, you can actually skip these work. Right? So this is what should component updates and uh, the unpush strategy in Angular 2 does. Uh, it allows you to explicitly tell the framework that uh, here you can skip this subtree. Like, I know things didn't change. Just don't bother about it. OK, so that was the pull strategy. It requires an explicit signal to make the system enter a pull cycle. But some libraries allow you to, to mutate the state, and, and things will just happen, right? For example, view. Um, and it doesn't need the, the auto pull mechanisms that Angular does. So how, how does that work, right? So one way to achieve that is to make our state objects expose getters and setters for the properties on it. This gives us the opportunity to, to intercept these accessing and uh, mutations, and so that gives us the opportunity to perform dependency tracking. Again, this is an extremely contrived example of, of how it works. Uh, in the getter, we will push an active job. The, the concept of job will be explained in the next slide. But uh, whenever something is accessed, and if there is an active job, we will push it into our subscriber array. And in the setter, we will just notify all the subscribers that this value has changed, so they need to be rerun. And the next function we implement is called auto run, which is basically a modified version of when state changes, the magic function. It takes the same update function and turns it into a job. And all the job does is wrap the update function and set itself as the current active job when it's being executed. So now, because the active job will be set before calling the update, and when we call update, the update function will access the A getter. The job will be pushed into the subscriber array of A. So later on, when we pass our render, uh, the, this whole execution logic into auto run, and if the render function accesses state.a during the render, the auto run will keep track of that. And whenever state.a changes later, um, this function will be run again. So this code, just to, just to show that it actually works, I put the code in the console. Um, and this is a console log that's logging the current value of a, my, a by 10. So if I put state.a equals 5, we should see 50 and 60. So now we have a system that uh, produce, is able to uh, calculate derived values or produce side effects as we want. And this is actually the foundation of the dependency tracking system that's being seen in Knockout, in Meteor's Tracker, and used in Bla Meteor Blaze, 
and also in Vue.js, and also in MobX. Um, all of these are primarily push-based systems. And the benefits of a push-based system is that because the system is now aware of what exactly has changed, it can be much more confident in skipping work. If a node in the tree needs to recompute and none of its children's dependencies have changed, then only that node will need to recompute. And when put into the context of a component tree, this means only components with explicit dependency changes need to re-render. Uh, think about a system. It, to make an analogy, it's basically a component system that with should component update already implement for you everywhere. And this, was this is what we're doing in Vue.js 2. So push and pull has a bunch of trade-offs. Uh, I'm almost out of time, so this is, I'm going to be going over this really fast. So the push system requires explicit, explicit pull signal from the user. Um, and this can be, some, uh, to some extent, mitigated by uh, intelligently calling this, uh, sending the signal for the user. For example, in, in Angular, we just always send out this signal inside event handlers. Uh, with zone.js, it always sends out signals even if you're doing async from the event handler. And um, it, in some cases, requires manual optimization hints and can be simplified in React, for example, if you use immutable data. Uh, the implementation could be much simpler. And a push-based system doesn't have the manual optimization requirements, but the cost of it is dependency tracking has a certain amount of bookkeeping cost. And because every property, reactive property that you're tracking ends up being stored in a closure and with a you know, subscriber array and dependency, all, this, all, all the, these extra objects results in a lot more memory allocation. And in sometimes, if your data set is extremely huge, this could potentially become a problem. And the way to mitigate that is uh, you can actually also use immutable objects so that the system knows that this object graph doesn't need to be converted and observed. So trade-offs, of course, there's no silver bullet. And real-world implementations actually often combine a mixed strategy of the two. So Angular 2, when using on push, can turn the part of the tree to, uh, to be push-based using observables. Right? React and MobX, you know, when you introduce MobX, you actually turn React into a more push primarily push-based system. And with Vue 2, although it's by default a push-based system, if you use immutable data with it, uh, and tell Vue to skip observation and always force updates, then you get a mixed system. And these are all real-world edge cases. And so I'm done contributing to the further confusion about reactivity. But hopefully, this talk has given you more insights on how frameworks works under the hood. Thank you. <laughs>